Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their health care providers. PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time, but please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Hypophysitis, Old Story with a New Twist, is being presented by Dr. Luma Gallup. Dr. Gallup is an esteemed endocrinologist at The Ohio State University. Dr. Gallup attended medical school at Baghdad University and completed a residency in internal medicine at Medical City Teaching Hospital in Baghdad. She then moved with her husband to New Zealand where they where she did her initial training at Auckland Healthcare. She did a second residency in internal medicine at the Medical College of Ohio. Dr. Gallup finished her endocrinology fellowship training in Chicago Medical School, Roseman Franklin University. Dr. Gallup joined The Ohio State University in 2013. She's been working closely with the neurosurgery and e the ENT team to create the state-of-the-art skull base and pituitary clinic. Dr. Gallup is a board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and the Endocrinology Board. She is currently an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism at The Ohio State University. Dr. Gallup has been awarded with the William L. Heinrich Resident Research Award and Preceptor Recognition from the Medical College of Ohio. She also received the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Award as an Outstanding Resident Role Model. Dr. Gallup has presented numerous CME courses, poster presentations, and has been involved in numerous lectures nationally and internationally. In addition, Dr. Gallup is a member of the Endocrine Society, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, the Pituitary Society, and the Pituitary Network Association. Dr. Gallup, thank you so much in your, for your involvement with PNA's webinar program. There's going to be a brief delay as we change presenters. Dr. Gallup, you should see on your end to accept. Yes. Okay, I can see your screen. Your sound is great. It's all yours. Excellent. Well, thank you for this kind presentation. Um, I would like today to talk about something that we haven't talked about in a while. I do attend a lot of the a PNA webinars and I really enjoy the wide variety of presentation that we do on this uh, amazing uh, network. Um, so I thought about doing something different, uh, something called hypophysitis, just because there's new information coming out about this uh, peculiar condition and I just want to share it with you. Um, I, I am a big believer in knowledge is power, regardless if you are a physician, if you are a patient, if you're a family member, if you know about pituitary or don't know a lot about pituitary, it's always good to learn new things. And we are all learning new things with the hypophysitis. So I usually like to present a case just because it's bring it closer to home and it just makes it more real. And then I will uh, move on to talk about uh, clinical presentation and the objective and all that. So this is a person I've met in the clinic. Um, she was a healthy young female who just been able to get pregnant in her first pregnancy and she was doing well until about a week 16 of her pregnancy. She started to have intense bad headaches, described them as 10 out of 10. Uh, she ended up seeing neurology, a headache specialist, and she was started on different medication, whatever they can use during pregnancy to help with the pain. Because the headache continued to get worse, they finally ended up doing a pituitary, uh, actually a brain MRI. And this is the MRI, and that's the sagittal view. And I, the contrast was not used during that study because of the pregnancy. So I tried to highlight where the red circle is, where the pituitary is. And people who see a lot of MRIs, this pituitary gland is enlarged. And the green line is I tried to put on top of where the optochiasm is, where the eye nerves are run on top of the pituitary. And due to that finding that the pituitary close to the optic nerve, she was referred to a neuro 
your ophthalmologist where they did a visual field exam and at that time there was no uh, visual defect and the plan was to try to start her on steroid to, uh, to buy some time until she have her baby. But then on a few weeks follow up um, she had a repeat visual field testing which showed now a new compression symptoms with a visual field defect. So she was referred urgently to neurosurgery and that's when we got to see her. Uh, she had a, a semi-urgent surgery to decompress the, the pituitary gland and um, to help prevent further visual uh, changes. So she finally was diagnosed with a confirmed diagnosis of hypophysitis. So what is hypophysitis? Um, so what I'm going to talk to today is what are what is the definition of hypophysitis? What are the different types of hypophysitis? When would we suspect it and how do we confirm it? And then I'm going to talk about different treatment options. Should we do medical therapy? Should, when should we do consider surgery? What else is available? And then at the end of the talk, I'll be more concentrating on the new type of the hypophysitis, and I guess that is the new twist, and what do we know about it so far? So hypophysitis is a condition when then the pituitary gland is inflamed and typically is infiltrated by immune cells, causing enlargement of the pituitary gland, a lot of time impairment of the function. Hypophysitis in general is uncommon, and that's why we don't hear a lot about it. Uh, but a bro and it can represent a different types all lumped together under the, the big umbrella of hypophysitis. So trying to um, to know how the progression of this disease. It was first reported in the 60s, and it's not common. It's one in eight million. It's considered one of the few indications for pituitary surgery, less than 1% of the cases that end up having surgery. In general, women are more common than men to have hypophysitis, and typically in the fourth decade. And it shows, um, special selection for females around pregnancy type type and uh, after they have their babies. How do they present? It depends on what's going on, but typically because of the enlarging inflamed pituitary gland, uh, usually people have bad headaches. They can have nauseous feeling and sometimes even vomiting. And a lot of the symptoms is related to the decreased pituitary function, depending on which one it is. Uh, and then we'll go into details about how do they, like what each hormone can present like. And at times it can, the symptoms can be related to this condition we call diabetes insipidus when the person have problem concentrating the urine and they have urinary symptoms. What caused hypophysitis? Really, we really don't know. Uh, but we think it's related something to the immune system when there's immune cells infiltrate the pituitary gland causing the swelling and, and the enlargement and all the consequences of having the inflammation. We think it's related to the immune system because it's, there are inflammatory cells in the, in the pituitary on pathology and because it can happen sometimes around pregnancy and mainly postpartum when the immune system can change a bit around the pregnancy. What types of hypophysitis? Now this is get a bit technical, but we just have to understand like hypophysitis, although we all call them the same, they're really not exactly the same. When a person just say hypophysitis just by itself, most probably they're referring to the lymphocytic hypophysitis, which is the most common cause of hypophysitis. And that's the one that's I, the case that I presented, and that's the typical one that's associated around pregnancy and immune uh, inflammation, where mainly the immune cells are lymphocytes that infiltrating the pituitary gland. Sometimes other immune cells can cause the inflammation. It depends on which one. Either can be gorillometis hypophysitis, when there is more macrophages and giant cells that's infiltrating this, the pituitary gland, or Xanthematous or IgG related and more plasmocytes infiltrating the pituitary gland, which is that uh, there's some case reports mainly in the Japanese literature showing um, cases of IgG hypophysitis or necrotizing, which more like there are a lot of necrosis involved in the pituitary gland. So this is how the pituitary gland look like under the microscope in different types of of hypophysitis after they remove the, some of the pituitary and see what type of cells infiltrating that gland causing the swelling.
Now, if we look into the anatomy, meaning which part of the vitreoretory get involved with that swelling, it can be mainly the interior part, and that's what we call adenohypophysitis that get inflamed, or it can be mainly the posterior pituitary with the infundibulum. The stock get inflamed, and that's what's called infundibular neurohypophysitis, or most commonly the whole gland is enlarged, and that's what term panhypophysitis. Both types are inflamed and swollen, and the whole gland is enlarged. So this is structurally, you can divide the hypophysitis, which one is involved. Now, people who like, like, tables this is for you uh, just people are different learners some like pictures some like tables um, but this is a very busy slide but what I'd like to highlight that it depend on what part of the pituitary gland is involved you can expect the presentation can be slightly different if the interior pituitary is enlarged so people have more headache can go supracellular extension extension causing vision problems and can cause hypopituitarism with the adrenal involvement or other hormones for the posterior hypophysitis or neural hypophysitis, the main presentation would be diabetes insipidus. If it's pan, it will be a combination of uh, DI, hypopid, and headaches and uh, visual disturbances. Now, in general, if there is no reason for the, for the inflammation that, that we can identify, we call it primary hypophysitis, means the problem is starting in the pituitary, and that's where, where all the problems happening. Now, sometimes this inflammation in the pituitary gland is actually secondary something else that, in, that irritated in the pituitary gland. We had a case that they had a Rathke's list that ruptured and irritated the pituitary gland. And on pathology, there was hypophysitis secondary to a ruptured Rathke cyst or a ruptured craniopharyngioma, or uh, this inflammation is secondary to sarcoidosis involving the pituitary gland. And at times can be associated with sarcoidosis somewhere else in the body, not just in the pituitary, or histocytosis, or, or even infection. Bacteria can cause inflammation in the in the pituitary gland. So it will be this hypophysitis is secondary to bacterial infection or fungal infection that's causing the inflammation. So that's a bit important to know if the, if you're dealing with only inflammation in the pituitary gland for no no reason, or this inflammation is actually secondary to something else that's bigger, that can involve other system. So this is important to keep in mind, a primary versus this is secondary hypophysitis, meaning this inflammation is secondary to something else that triggered the problem. Now, um, as we're we're endocrinologists, I, I am an endocrinologist, so we really, uh, from, from our point of view, we really pay close attention to the function of the pituitary. So when we see there is inflammation in the pituitary gland, the first thing that comes to our mind is, is it functioning well? Is there a problem with the function? Now the surgeon look at it different, from a different angle. Is this gland big enough, pushing on the optochias and pushing on surrounding structure? Does it need surgery? So we always concentrate on, on the pituitary gland from different angles to make sure there is we we're doing a good job. So when we do think this person have hypophysitis, we really have to run the whole list. Is this functioning, is this pituitary gland functioning normal? We do evaluate for anterior pituitary dysfunction, mainly um, thyroid function, adrenal axis, gonadal axis, et cetera. And we do evaluate for the diabetes insipidus. Is the person able to concentrate their urine? Do they have a DI? At the same time, it would not be a bad idea if you're suspecting secondary hypophysitis is to look for other things that can trigger hypophysitis. For example, checking an ACE level, looking for sarcoidosis, doing a CBC, differential count, C-reactive protein, ESR, looking for inflammation in the rest of the body, maybe even doing a CT chest, looking for sarcoidosis if this is high on top of your differential if that's causing the, the cause of the hypophysitis. So uh, just to keep a wide angle of looking is what's going on in the big picture, not looking only at the pituitary gland. 
Now, how do we expect the pituitary to look like when we're having a case of hypophysitis? These are not our patient slides. This is I found on the online. Um, so typically, if you suspect hypophysitis, you'd like to order a dedicated pituitary MRI, and if possible, with contrast. Now, our case, we didn't, couldn't give her contrast because she was uh, pregnant, and she didn't have even a pituitary MRI. She had a brain MRI. They were worried about other aneurysm, other causes of her headaches. So, but typical case, if with contrast, you see the whole gland uh, pick up the contrast with intense homogeneous, means the whole gland light up uh, with the gadolinium. And now if you look at the coronal section, um, they talk about a pear shape, like the whole gland is enlarged, uh, and the stalk typically enlarged too with the gland, especially if they're having the panhypophysitis or the one that's involving the pituitary stalk. Now, how do we treat it once we think this is hypophysitis? Most of the cases is actually diagnosed clinically. If you have clinical enough clinical data and the picture is supportive of hypophysitis, uh, typically you don't go and biopsy every pituitary gland to produce to confirm this is hypophysitis. Most of the time it's treated with steroid. Trying the concept is trying to decrease the swelling and the inflammation, check the hormonal function, replace what's deficient, and if there is DI, uh, correct the DI. So that's medical treatment. When would we consider surgery? It's just like our patient. If a person have bad mass effect, pushing on the optic chiasm, having visual problems, if the headaches are severe, intractable, not able to control with medical therapy, then you consider decompression surgical. Or if you're really not sure of the diagnosis, you're worried about histocytosis, sarcoidosis, and there's no other uh, site that you can biopsy that's easier to biopsy, then maybe surgery can be a useful uh, tool to confirm your suspicion and confirm your, your diagnosis. Um, and then um, keep in mind, medical therapy is, as um, although it's effective, uh, there are a lot of cases of free wraps uh, once the, the steroid doses are weaned down, to keep that in mind. It's not going to be an easy one-week steroid and you stop and everything is perfect and the swelling is gone. What happens if each time you wean down the steroid, there's recurrence and the headaches is back and the swelling is back? Um, ha there have been case reports of using other immunosuppressants like methotrexate, azathioprine, cytoxin. Remember, these are case reports, so it's part two. There's no big multi-center studies to show the efficacy of these medications. There are a few case reports. Um, University of Virginia reported a case of radiation, using radiation therapy of uh, repeat uh, hypophysitis, and we really had a successful case. She had medical therapy, she had surgery, and she having recurrence of her headache, recurrence of the swelling of the pituitary gland, and we did give her, uh, we did use fractionated radiation therapy, and she did much better in this the swelling has uh, gone down and she's on maintenance replacement uh, therapy. Now let's go back to our case. So what happened to her? So after the decompression, um, her vision uh, changes has improved significantly. Uh, the pathology did show significant infiltrate of numerous cells of small lymphocytes, uh, and it was um, suggestive of lymphocytic hypophysitis rather than a pituitary adenoma. Uh, she had, she was put on steroid. Unfortunately, she did develop gestational diabetes from the high-dose steroids. Um, she did have her baby a few weeks later with a C-section with a healthy baby. Um, the, the, the gestational diabetes resolved after the, the baby was born, but she continued on reasonably high dose of prednisone. Um, evaluation of her pituitary, rest of her pituitary function, she did have central hypothyroidism and has been started on thyroid replacement. She did not have other hypopituitarism. She's able to breastfeed. She did not have diabetes insipidus, and we are now in the process of weaning down the steroid slowly. And I just saw her yesterday in the clinic, and she just had a repeat MRI. And um, so this is the MRI that I showed you earlier on 
before uh, all this. And you can see the pituitary, now we, had, we were able to use contrast because she already had her baby. And you can see that pituitary gland is still swollen. Um, it's bad. If you see the thin layer here of CSF that's um, separating the pituitary, gland from the optochiasm. So we have to be careful. I do want to wean down the steroid as soon as it's able to, but I don't want to wean too fast and this pituitary can enlarge again and causing problems. So what should I tell her? Uh, like, what is the outcome? How long this swelling is going to be? And what's the chances of it's gone? What's the chances of her pituitary function recover? And what to expect long term? Um, so this has had been looked into. And from the MRI finding, uh, half of the cases do improve and quarter stay stable. And there is a quarter that actually can, the swelling can progress. Same thing with pituitary hormone deficiencies, uh, about a quarter actually improve and recover, half stays this st stable, and about less than a quarter they may have further worsening of the pituitary function. So this is important to keep in mind. It's not a simple, easy two, three week Thing and they don't need follow-up. Um, this may come back, it may cause more MRI changes or uh, pituitary function changes. Um, Long-term outcome, so niche of response to glu glucocorticoid to steroid is amazing. Almost 97% will respond, but once you start weaning down in the steroid and take them off the steroid, the recurrence rate is high. It's almost 40%. They may have another episode or relapse of the hypophysitis. Um, and then even after surgery, we had a case, you had a surgery and the, the, the condition came back even after decompression surgery. Now, this is the old story. This is what typically we used to get in medical school. Hypophysitis is not common, but usually have severe, severe headache, more than what you expect and see on the MRI. And typically, it's a young female around pregnancy or just had their baby. Now, in the last few years, we start to see a whole different type of hypophysitis. And that's what the immune checkpoint inhibitor induced hypocytis. And that's when I said in the beginning of the, of the presentation, knowledge is power. When you don't know what you're dealing with, it just makes you feel worried and, and unknown. But that's what our my job, I love my job, because you never stop learning. You keep learning new things um, as, as things progress and we start to have more information about things. Um, so I'm just going to present another person I've seen in the clinic. It's, she'd been a few years ago, but that's how that she was one of the, the early cases that we started to learn about this new type of hypophysitis. So she's, a, a, again, a 30-year-old female who had a back lesion. She was actually at a different state. Um, she had a back lesion, was, di was biopsied, and was found to have a melanoma, uh, but she had a surgically removed, and there was no evidence of metastasis. She's doing great. She relocated uh, here uh, for a job, and then she reestablished with a new oncologist, and she was just having a routine chest x-ray, and she was found to have bilateral lung nodules. They were biopsied and they were proven to be melanoma metastasis. So after a long discussion with the oncologist, uh, finally she was started on a new agent, and I will just, I will explain what these are, but she was started on a new agent called nivolumab and epilumab, and she was part of a study uh, studying these agents for melanoma. Uh, metastasis. And the first cycle, she did great. The second cycle, she did okay, but then a few late, days later, she starts up having some itching and a rash on her skin. And a few days later, after the second cycle, she starts to have some headaches. So she followed up with her oncologist. These headaches were getting worse. She started to have more fatigue and dizziness. And she didn't have vision problem, but just very bad headaches and not feeling well. It started to be just generally overall weak. Her oncologist initially was worried about a brain metastasis, so they ordered a brain MRI. Uh, there was no metastasis, but it did show enlargement of the pituitary gland concerning for hypophysitis. So the first, uh, these MRIs on the right is 
her baseline MRI. This was before she received any. It was done part of the staging to make sure she doesn't have brain metastasis before they started the immunomodulator. And this is a very nice, healthy, beautifully looking pituitary gland. Anterior pituitary, nice posterior uh, bright spot, which is the neural hypothesis, and a nice thin stalk connecting the rest of the pituitary to the gland, and that's the optochiasm right there. So this is her baseline MRI, and this without, and this with contrast T1 MRIs. This is T1 with contrast, and if you see the whole pituitary gland is enlarged, bigger than what it was before, and uh, even there's some enlargement of the pituitary stalk. So she, so what is, so she was diagnosed with hypophysitis and that's when I got to meet her. So what is this immune checkpoint immunotherapy? What is this and what is this new hypophysitis that we are learning about? So I'm just going to go back to just some basic concepts. The immune system have checks and balances. Uh, so there is a positive and a negative regulation system in the immune function. If the immune system is overactivated, it starts to attack the rest of the body, and this is just the basis of autoimmune disease. This is the basis of hypothyroidism, type 1 diabetes, lupus, just autoimmune diseases. If the immune system is underactive, then people can have all sorts of infection, and the theory is some harmful cells can start to escape the immune system causing abnormal cells, causing cancer cells. So this is the check and balance, the yin and yang of the immune system. So the concept of these new agents called immune checkpoint inhibitors, these are monoclonal antibodies to attack the inhibitory system of the immune uh, cell. In simpler words, it's inhibiting the inhibition of the immune system, meaning unleashing the immune system to start to attack the cancer cells. So this is the new concept of this new, it's not really chemotherapy. Chemotherapy you just kills all the, uh, the rapidly dividing cells. This type is more a clever uh, like a cancer treatment. It's, it's unleash the immune system to attack the cancer cells. So there are a lot of these immunotherapy, anti-CTLA, anti-programmed death uh, uh, one, a programmed death ligand one, a monoclonal antibody, and the list is really growing so fast. I cannot keep up with all the the agents that being uh, approved. Um, it is approved for used to use for metastatic melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, not small cell lung cancer, head and neck cancer, some urology cancers, lymphomas, even ovarian cancers, even there's some early studies, breast cancer, colon cancer. Our institute is so big in oncology that there's so many studies going on to treat all sorts of different cancers. Um, but always there is a bad. So if you can imagine the unleashed immune system can be sometimes overactive, if I can say that, and it starts to attack different parts of the, of the body, causing uh, immune modulator-related adverse events, side effects. And if we can think about different systems that the immune system can attack, and these are, these are the same systems that are susceptible to autoimmune diseases anyway. So like the skin can have uh, all sort of rashes, the, the, the GI system, the gastrointestinal system, we've seen cases that have colitis, hepatitis, pancreatitis. In the endocrine system, the thyroid gland, always known to be attacked by immune system, anyway, we know about the Graves and the Hashimoto thyroiditis, so we're seeing cases of hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism used by this medication, primary adrenal gland involved, even the pancreas causing uh, diabetes, and the pituitary gland can get involved in these agents in the immune system causing swelling of the pituitary gland, and that's what happened to that patient that I presented to you. A kidney can get involved, lung, we had a case of pneumonitis, heart, immune system, nervous system, any, a lot of the systems can be involved with these agents. Now, when would it happen and how often that should we get involved? In general, about 10 to 5%. 
Um, typically, it can happen early, although there's some cases reported. We had a case they were on two years on immunotherapy until they start to have the immune reaction. But on average, it happens after the second, third cycle of the treatment. Older age and that's different. Gender, male gender, is more considered a risk factor for hypophysitis. And the epilumab, that's one of the two agents that the patient I presented to you, is being um, more strongly associated with, pitched, with hypophysitis specifically. And there's a lot of study happening. Why is that? And why, what's specific about epilumab compared to the other immunomodulators? Um, so how would they present? Sort of similar and not similar to the old known hypophysitis. So typically they present, uh, can present very vaguely. They can have just mild little he headaches, they have some fatigue, they have body ache, and they can present with the symptoms of the hypopituitarism. Um, vision problems and disturbed vision is very rare, and diabetes insipidus involving the posterior pituitary is almost unheard of, very, very rare. And the problem is half of these cases can be asymptomatic. Or remember, these are cancer patients. Usually they have an advanced stage of cancer, and a lot of them do feel tired to start with, fatigue, dizzy a bit. So they really, can, these symptoms can be easily missed and not, uh, not be noticed until more later on in the course of the, the condition. So that's very, very important. And that's more an awareness of to be more aware. And a lot of the newer uh, oncology studies are embedding now checking hormone levels are part of the regular checkup with every cycle of these medications. Um, now, one or more of the pituitary gland functions is involved in these cases, the majority of them is actually the adrenal, pituitary adrenal axis, which is important. Thyroid is common, less common are the gonadal and growth hormone deficiency. And most of the cases are treated with steroid. Now, there's still big debate, should we give them a very high intense pulse steroid versus just replacement steroid? That's still a bit of a controversy. For other, like a severe colitis or severe hepatitis, yes, we do give high doses of pulse steroids. Uh, with the hypophysitis, there's still some debate. I guess if there is severe headache, um, the, the enlargement close to the pituitary pituitary uh, optochiasm, then yes, you may want to give higher dose steroids. In less severe cases, replacing just the whatever deficient is important. Now again, for people who like tables, and I did try to highlight the important point. So this is, there is an amazing review um, a chapter book about uh, hypophysitis uh, written by Salvadori is just an amazing uh, uh, wealth of information. And in, in this table, or the, I adjusted that table, I removed some of the information to make it simpler to follow. It's just a nice um, uh, like a comparison between the primary hypophysitis, that's the old type of hypophysitis, the pregnancy one, versus the new checkpoint inhibitor. They're both autoimmune, but sort of the inflammation is different. One is like more lymphocyte infiltrate. This is more a hypersensitivity type of a reaction. As we said, the old primary hypophysitis is mainly female, younger, associated with pregnancy, with the checkpoint inhibitor are more common in male and older people. And the old hypophysitis, I keep on calling it old, I guess I have to call it the primary lymphocytic hypophysitis. Uh, headaches are common, adrenal, about third of the cases, uh, diabetes insipidus, about third of the cases, and typically the pituitary glands enlarge big enough to cause some visual disturbances. In the in new immune checkpoint inhibitors, adrenal is on top of the problem, and most of the symptoms they present with lethargy, tiredness, dizziness because of the severe adrenal insufficiency, pituitary adrenal axis involved. Headaches are common, uh, but less visual disturbances, very rare diabetes insipidus. Um, and the same thing with the MRI. Most of the MRI finding is very classic, very obvious, and that's how we diagnose hypophysitis for, for the primary hypophysitis, while for the um, 
checkpoint inhibitor, a third of the cases they may have a normal MRI. I think what's what happens is the enlargement of the pituitary gland in the MRI, it, it happened transiently. And within a few weeks, that enlargement is gone. So if you don't suspect it early and you don't do your MRI in the beginning, if you do it later on in the course, um, that, MRI, that swelling in the pituitary could have already happened and resolved before you got your MRI and you get a perfectly normal MRI. Uh, the treatment, they're both, we, we use uh, glucocorticoid steroids and, um, sorry, and then um, the, the outcome is a bit variable, a high recurrence rate for the primary hypophysitis, for the immuno checkpoint inhibitors, the swelling always goes away, so it's not structural, it's more of the, if, if the function that doesn't recover, and almost all primary, sorry, almost all central adrenal insufficiency persists. It's irreversible. While thyroid involvement, other axes have been reported to be reversible. And this is very important. And I'll show it to you in, in, in the case that I presented what happened to her. Uh, so as I said, function is uncommon to recover, especially the pituitary adrenal axis. MRI, typically transient and resolved within a month or so. Steroid, oh, the last two points, these are important. So steroid are not thought to be and have a negative influence on the, tr the benefit of immunotherapy. Although most of the oncology protocol, if they are on a very high dose of steroid, they hold the, the treatment until the steroid dose is a low enough dose so they can restart the immunotherapy. Uh, and the other thing, I always like to think of the positive things of have a, 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 neg a, a like a good twist to things. The, what we noticed that having hypophysitis is actually a, a predictor of a good outcome from this immunomodulator. And the concept, I think, is, is if the immune system is unleashed, like was so effective that it starts to attack the, the pituitary gland and attack other things, it probably is the, the medication has worked and unleashed the immune system to attack the cancer cells. So let's go back to the, the, the melanoma case that I, I shared with you. So she did, was well started on the high dose steroid. The dose was weaned down gradually. Um, the, she did have a rash on her arm and, and trunk, but she did not have diabetes insipidus or diabetes mellitus um, with the high steroid. Uh, she did see oncology. Um, she already was planning to have only four cycle of the combo therapy and then continue on only nivolumab. So the epilimab was stopped, and she, till now, um, she takes the nivolumab. Um, the dose of the prednisone white titrated slow, and uh, she really was worried about staying on steroid long term. So we tried. At that time, really, there was not a lot of uh, data outcome were published about the, this type of hypothesis. So we tried to wean down. I changed it to hydrocortisone, and I did the ACT8 cositropin stimulation test. And if you see on the table, her cortisol level were like a flat line. It didn't even budge with the simulation. And I knew that day when I saw her when she came for the stem test, she did not look well. And I knew she was going to fail the stem test. So she was placed back on hydrocortisol. Uh, the rest of her pituitary function remained normal, and she never had diabetes insipidus. Um, now, this is the MRI finding. So the first set of MRI here, that was the baseline before the immunomodulator therapy. That's when she presented with the headache and that's when the hypophysitis was diagnosed. This is a few months later. The MRI finding has completely reversed back to where they were, um, although her adrenal function, the pituitary adrenal function never recovered. So just to summarize things, uh, hypophysitis is rare. But it's important to keep in mind, especially if the whole pituitary gland is enlarged and pick up the contrast intensely in the whole gland light up, you really want to think about at least keep it in the differential diagnosis rather than this is just a pituitary adenoma. Uh, hypophysitis can be primary, but you want to keep uh, in mind the secondary causes that can trigger hypophysitis. And now hypophysitis is not uncommon. It's actually common with hypophysitis and need to be looked for and reported place if it's found. Uh, medical therapy in general with steroid is first-line treatment. 
Now we know what's the indication for surgery or other immunotherapy or a radiation therapy. Now recurrence is not uncommon. You expect that you don't just wean the steroid and you're done. You, you really need to keep monitoring about what's going to happen and if the recurrence will happen and what to do with it. Now, and then with the, with the new experience that we uh, had in the last few years, really learn to know how to communicate with other teams, uh, keep all the options open, keep good communication, and keep a lookout for uh, any new uh, development that's going on with, the, uh, with this. It's exciting, but it's just a new type of uh, treatment that we're all learning and um, and uh, sharing with others. And thank you for listening, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Hello. I'm not sure if I finished too early. <laughs> I know I have a whole hour, but I thought to wrap it up so I can have time to answer questions if there are any. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what is happening. That's okay. I hope the others can do that. <laughs> <Yeah>, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and when you're going through immunotherapy, what are some of the first signs to look for that there may be an issue? Yeah, that's a great question. Just because it's, it can be very vague. As I said, most of the oncology, especially these agents, most of the people who are getting these agents are part of a, a study. And most of the studies now, they do have um, thyroid function and at times cortisol levels are embedded within, within the protocol. So they get labs every three or two weeks before they get the new chemo cycle. Um, now, for as a, as a person, what to look for mainly is headaches, uh, blurred vision, and this dizziness, lethargy, uh, like very weak, and most of it is because of the low cortisol level. We had people getting admitted to the hospital. They're just so tired, so dizzy, nauseous, hypotensive, and that's how they came to the surface and were diagnosed. Excellent. Thank you. If someone has a pituitary tumor and high prolactin level, how often would you repeat MRI? Oh, so this is a whole different question that's not related to the to <laughs> right. the that is, but that's okay. So it depends. It depends if they are on treatment or not. So if I do have a, if I suspect this is a hyper, uh, like prolactinemia due to a prolactinoma, and I'm starting medical therapy, typically I check prolactin within a few weeks to see medical, like the response. And I usually we don't do MRI right away because I, we know it can the prolactin level go down first before the MRI changes. Um, so we may not do MRI until two, three uh, months. If it's a small prolactinoma and it's not even close to the optochasm and the prolactin levels are millimeter elevated, we treat medically and we don't repeat MRI until six or even 12 months after treatment. Okay, thank you. I have combined immune deficiency and received regular infusions of immune globulin. Mm -hmm. These infusions seem to set off my hypophysitis symptoms. I have autoimmune hypophysitis. Lowering my IgG has increased my infections, whereas increasing it seems to increase the hypophysitis symptoms. Most recently, I was in ICU for an acute adrenal crisis due to the stress of pneumonia, the flu, disseminated zoster. The adrenal crisis was severe and involved hyponatremia and hypokalemia. Can you comment? Yeah, that's a very complex case. So you look just between like a catch-21 and the immune system is low, but if you improve the immune system, then it can cause the, that can exacerbate the hypophysitis. That's a tricky, tricky case. I don't, um, just it's hard. Um, I guess is is the, if, if, it's deemed that this person have adrenal insufficiency, then they need to be on steroid long term. They need to really know about the sickness 
they rule to get a pulse steroid when they have an acute illness in anticipation of an adrenal crisis. So if, um, if there have not been officially confirmed to have adrenal insufficiency in between these episodes, I do recommend highly to get a thorough investigation for the pituitary function to see if the adren pituitary adrenal access is functional or not, and to look for other um, deficiency, like for example, uh, hypothyroidism can worsening hyponatremia and the potassium and all that. So to have a full, full evaluation of the pituitary function. Thank you. Can elevated complement proteins, CH50 testing, be a symptom or cause of hypophysitis? Uh, not really, not as far as I am aware of. That's more of an immune defect problems causing swelling and now you're testing my immunology knowledge. <laughs> which is a bit uh, hard. Yeah, but not, I'm not aware of complement deficiency is cause or can trigger or associated with hypophysitis. Okay, I'm being told by our endocrinologist that a small to pituitary tumor can't affect the vision. Uh, I guess it's all depend on uh, where where the tumor is and what the MRI show because it's, size is not the only criteria. We have like six, seven small microadenomas, but if they sit right there, supracellular pushing on the optic chiasm, it's rare. Uh, typically, macro, the big ones, is closer to the optic chiasm. But we had a case yesterday. He had like almost a two centimeter uh, pituitary adenoma, but it's all extending inferiorly down in the cella and the octocasm is perfectly free. So it's where the size matter, but where is the tumor and how close, you can actually see the tumor and how close it is to the optic nerve or not. Excellent, thank you. What might be the reason for predominance of a poon if a lumen <laughs> bab? What? I can't say that word. <laughs> what? It, it, it's the uh, epilimuba mab. Oh, epilimumab. Yeah, oh, what's see, the... that's easy, much easier for you to say. Oh, just we call it epi. We call it epi for okay. a short. <laughs> what might be what the reason question? for the predominance of epi for checkpoint inhibitor induced hypophysitis? Should we expect yeah. this condition also with other inhibitors? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Actually, there's a ton of research now on epilimab. It's almost like they stumbled into something. They think that epilimab, because remember, it's, an, an, it's a monoclonal antibody that attack a specific part for the immune checkpoints that regulate the immune system. And now they're thinking, could that antigen is actually present in the the healthy pituitary gland, and is that monoclonal antibody specifically attacking the pituitary gland? And believe it or not, now there are some research looking, is epilimab, could epilimab be a treatment for pituitary tumors? Because we know it likes to attack the pituitary gland. And they, there are a ton of research going on now is why epi selectively hits the pituitary gland. And they think there are some, uh, some parts of the pituitary gland that the epilimab like to attack. And that's the basis of a lot, a lot of research. So stay tuned. You may hear more about the epi from a, it's now there, it's now not used as much for, for the cancer patients in general, just because there are other agents that have less toxicity, but the pituitary world has picked up epi and now trying to see why it's attacking the gland and can we use it to attack, let's say, pituitary adenomas. Wow, interesting. Uh, do you yeah. know if a majority of endocrinologists know about this condition and how to diagnose this and care for a patient with it? Oh, I hope so. I mean, if, if the endocrinologist is really interested in pituitary, uh, yes, they, I guess they should, yeah, they would know about hypophysitis, although it's it's rare, but it is a known, a known thing. But if somebody who really don't see pituitary cases and don't think about pituitary, it can easily be missed. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. Anybody else has questions? Uh, nothing else coming in right now. This was yeah. fascinating, and you're right, it is a topic we haven't covered. Um, so excellent, excellent information. We really appreciate your time.
And, and we and are, we, we really, we all are learning. I mean, this is something that has like changed in the last couple of years. And before you were really don't see much of literature search, but each time there's more and more publication coming out just to enlighten us and enlighten everybody about this and, and make people aware of it. Yes, very important. I do have another question that popped up. Um, no one can find my pituitary gland. I had a large pituitary tumors that had invaded my carotid area and right sinus cavity. It was removed um, at U of M in Michigan. It grew back. Stereotactic radiation done at Mayo. What about a missing gland? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, that's not uncommon. A lot of times we look for the pituitary gland, even when the tumor is still there. Sometimes it can be just that thin paper, like my neurosurgeon that I work with, he's just amazing, always try to look for the, for the where's Waldo to look for the pituitary gland because that's very important when planning the approach for the surgery because we really don't want to hurt that pituitary, the, whatever left of the healthy pituitary gland. Uh, but uh, so it's usually squished somewhere in one of the corners at the two, as the tumors start to grow. Now post-surgery, it all depends on the surgeon, the approach, if the, the pituitary was involved through the, the, the approach for the surgery. Now, now with stereotactic now, so you have three ins insults to the pituitary, to the healthy pituitary, the tumor itself, the surgery, and the radiation. Now, I've seen some amazing pituitary glands in spite of even two, three surgeries that the, the pituitary very still function, even if you can't even identify it on MRI. Um, but um, that's very rare. Most of the more insults to that pituitary gland, the function is start to go down and sometimes the, the whole pituitary is removed during the surgery. It's inevitable, especially if it's a tumor like as big as the, the um, as he's describing or she's describing that's so big invading the cavernous sinus. It can well be destroyed by the tumor, by the surgery or by the radiation and it may not function. So it's not more important to see where it is, it's more important to see if it's still functioning or not. And I, I'm sure that he'd been or she'd been evaluated and either replaced if it's if they'd have hypopituitarism. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some questions about where are the centers? Was the best way to find an endocrinologist who is versed in pituitary disorders? Um, I guess PNA is a yeah. great source to look at the center closer to you. There is a lot of amazing data and information uh, at the PNA uh, for, like, I guess, addresses and geographical distribution of the surgeons and endocrinologists. Thank you. Yes, uh, pituitary.org, we have a list, two lists, actually, one of physicians and one of hospitals, medical centers that have pituitary centers. Uh, you're better off being in a pituitary center where they have multidisciplinary teams. So you can find those on our website or you can contact me directly. I can help you. My email address is Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y, at pituitary.org. Um, another question, how does hypophysitis affect life expectancy when on daily hydrocortisone? Yeah, so I mean, it all depends on the function. The inflammation itself, uh, when it's active and acute, it causes a lot of comorbidity, meaning the headaches, the vision, and all that. But what really affects mortality is if the function, if there is a hypopituitarism or not, and if it's replaced accurately or not. Uh, so this is more a question, is hypopid affect mortality or not? And we know if there is, if they are not replaced right, if they're over-treated or under-treated, unfortunately can have have uh, effect on quality of life and even life expectancy. So it's mainly the function and if it's replaced accurately or not. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think that concludes our questions. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time out to join us. This concludes today's webinar presentation. Uh, if we didn't get a chance to answer your questions, which I think we answered most of them, or if you have additional questions, wait, there's one more. <laughs> uh, thank you for so, so much for this. My question is, after a tumor is removed and radiation 31 years later, my pituitary kicked in raising my thyroid levels, but it finally stopped after six months. Could this have been hypophysitis? Oh, uh... Uh, very unlikely, but that's a very bizarre scenario for to have hypopit for 30 years and then all of a sudden have a normal thyroid function and then the thyroid function goes down again. 
Unlikely because, I mean, I don't know. I really can't unless I see the MRIs. I mean, if there, if the most of the time, if the, the pituitary has been damaged structurally and physiologically by radiation and all that, unlikely it's even recover, uh, especially after 30 years. It will be very, very unlikely to have a hypophysitis on top of a dead pituitary. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But we never say never unless we look at MRIs and all that. Right. Excellent. Interesting case, though. Um, all right, I think that's it. <laughs> a lot of thank well, yous. We also well, thank you. Excellent and information. I, I thank you really for giving me the opportunity to be part of a, a PNA. It's always a pleasure. Yes, it is always a pleasure. And another question: <laughs> I was diagnosed with ITT testing. Even with this, doctors I see, ER and PCP, continue to not understand, want to withhold or withdraw steroids. I have been told by my diagnosing center to avoid these physicians, but that is impossible. It is dangerous and frightening, the ignorance around the, and it ends there. About steroid. I think, um, yes, uh-huh. So steroid is hard. That I showed you the scary part of trying to wean steroid and trying to wake up the adrenal and pituitary gland. Uh, it depends all on the pre, like before the weaning process. Do we think there's still a function that it may come back? Is it worth trying to wean the steroid off? Or not. If the steroid was used for a whole different diagnosis, let's say like ITT or um, let's say arthritis or lupus or whatever the steroid was used, it depends on how long the person has been on steroid and what high dose they have to be on steroid. But once that underlying condition, if the rheumatologist, the hematologist, whoever was started the steroid, tell us that they don't need the steroid anymore then it's worth giving the body a second chance and it's worth trying to wake up that pituitary and that adrenal gland to see if they are willing to work again. But if there is a significant damage to the pituitary, like somebody who had a bad surgery and radiation to their pituitary and we know their pituitary is done, gone, 30 years, there's no point in trying to wean and see if it will wake up. But if there is a preclinical possibility, judgment, that this pituitary is not done, not dead, and the adrenals are, there is a possibility they may wake up. It's worth trying to wean and stim to see if it will wake up. Um, but it is a very delicate process, and you really want to watch the, 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 watch the process very carefully because you can put people at jeopardy if you don't know what you're doing or you do it in, in a wrong situation. Like now, I know what I know about the immuno checkpoint hypophysitis, especially if they received Epilumab. I really try not even to wean and, and get them into that uh, that flat line that I showed you in that case. But in other cases, like somebody who had pituitary surgery and we think the rest of the pituitary is healthy, definitely it's worth uh, weaning and see if their own pituitary is willing to start to work again and to take over. Yeah, I think that kind of highlights the uh, requirements or the necessity to have experts uh, working on your case. And multidisciplinary teams are also important for that same reason. Um, we are lucky to know about quite a few of them. So again, if you need any information for finding one of these teams, you can visit pituitary.org. Ohio State University has an excellent team. Um, and there are several others throughout the country. Uh, if we didn't get to all your questions, you have more that you think about later, you can contact us with those. Uh, if you missed any part of this webinar or would like to share it with your family and friends, it is being recorded. Uh, we will get it up available on our website, hopefully by this afternoon after it's edited. There's going to be a brief survey after the webinar. Also fill that out to help us get the information that you would like to hear. Um, this concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Gallup, for your time and excellent information. You all have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you next month. Take care.